to all our viewers. Welcome to the second episode of the Colburn School's live stream series, A Serving of Beethoven Lunchtime Concerts. I'm Christy Brown Montesano, Chair of Music History at the Colburn School, and I'm here with Scott St. John, our Director of Chamber Music, and a special guest, violist Abigail Smith, a second year undergraduate at the Colburn Conservatory of Music. The Colburn School hopes that a serving of Beethoven, which will be offered every Thursday at noon for the next few weeks, helps us stay Colburn connected with the performing arts and also keeps the party going for Beethoven's 250th birthday, which happens on December 16th of this year. While we all miss being in the live concert hall, I certainly do, the online platform for a serving of Beethoven lunchtime concerts does offer our viewers and listeners the chance to engage with us directly by submitting questions about Beethoven, the featured quartet, or other related subjects. Just post a question in the comment section of our live stream on the Colburn School Facebook page. Scott, Abby, and I will do our best to answer your questions, and if we can't, maybe another listener will. Save us. Uh, Scott, you are playing in today's performance. Can you introduce Abby a little more and tell us about today's quartet? Yes, absolutely. And hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to be hearing Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 59, number two. And this was originally performed back in October during our Beethoven 250 festival. Colburn was really immersed in Beethoven for that week uh, that was built around the string quartet cycle. We celebrated Beethoven's birthday and also honored our longtime faculty legend, Arnold Steinhardt. For the two weeks preceding the festival, groups of mixed students and faculty prepared many of the quartets for performance. And Abigail Smith uh, and I worked on this 59 number two quartet along with students Hannah Zahn and Minji Kim. So Abby, um, is it okay if I call you Abby? Abigail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Abby is a viola student here at Colburn studying with Paul Coletti. And Abby, we're really glad that you're joining us today for this live chat. Um, so maybe uh, you could share with us a little bit of the experience of what it was like to prepare this quartet for performance. Um, it was really fun and thanks for inviting me. Um, so last when when the festival originally happened, it was like my second month of freshman year. I, when I first got offered the opportunity, I was really nervous and it was really intimidating because I was a freshman among a group of with a with a teacher and then um Hannah I think is a master student and then Minji's also like an artist diploma or something like that. They were um a lot older and a lot more experienced than I was and this was also the first Beethoven quartet that wasn't a really early Beethoven quartet so it was I was really nervous um a Beethoven lunchtime. but it's been, it was really fun and it was um a fantastic experience for me and I really miss it I miss chamber music <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. And I think it's um, it's one of the great things about Colburn that we do a lot of faculty student collaborations um, like we did in the Beethoven Festival. And um, and it really gets gives a chance to put on a, a professional style um, a schedule uh, in that we put these things together quite quickly. Um, and the students are expected to be extremely well prepared and, you know, that we um, th that we we really work on things that I think would be very much like like a chamber music festival. So it's um, it's it's a wonderful for all of us, and um, and we're so glad that uh, you know the students seem to always rise to the occasion and uh, play spectacularly. Uh, I think we had a great I, I had a great time working with you, of course, and with uh, with the other students that were involved. Um, it was quite a daunting challenge, though. I, I felt like fifty nine number two. Um, I, I had never played it before myself, and and I think all of us felt like it was a mountain, um, and and maybe not quite enough rehearsal time to feel really comfortable. <laughs> um, 
Um, <laughs> and and it's always daunting when you're not a real string quartet. I mean, you know, the um, the amount of time that professional string quartets rehearse uh, and they get chances to play these pieces over and over again. Uh, so, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's it's a great challenge, and I, I think I think we did a good job, but it was definitely uh, a lot of work. And yeah, uh, and I wonder if if you did you feel nervous as we were heading into this? Um, I was nervous throughout the whole thing, the whole entire thing. I really, um, there's a really large viola part in this piece, and I really wanted to do it justice. And I really, I fell in love with the second movement, and I really wanted to be able to like make it like something that I was really proud of. And so it was just the, the entire, the, for the entire few weeks that we were rehearsing, the, the, all of it, I was just super nervous about. But it turned out pretty well in the end, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I wonder if, um, Christy, have you been checking the... Uh, yes, the I've been checking our feed. We're getting a lot of love, but we aren't getting uh, as much, we're not getting the questions uh, oh, so much. I mean, I would like to follow up. It's interesting because in some ways, what uh, you and Abby did was closer to the original context for the earlier string quartet, right? You throw a group together. Maybe the group's been together for a while as, as uh, we know that Chopin Sikh was, uh, always had a group around him. He was the violinist who uh, we believe premiered this, uh, but still it's kind of a quick, Thing. They generally didn't spend months and months and months reworking material and string quartets do today. They had that kind of scary uh, rehearse fast really well and then put it up in front of uh, some connoisseurs. So it's interesting that you have that experience. Welcome to history there, Abby, that you got to know what it was like. And uh, Scott, you got to be Shufansik, right? You got to play that role this That's time, true. bringing everybody. And they they started out as a very young, he was really young when he came to first Prince Le Le Lichnowski, sorry, uh, working with him. So he was pretty much, they were teenagers, early 20s when they were first playing. And then by the time they got to Opus 59, uh, more mature players. So a little bit of history there. Now I wanted to say, um, oh, we do have a question. This one's for you, Abby. What's mm -hmm. it, this is Hannah Louise von Falkenstein, great name, asked you what specifically made the viola part so nerve wracking? Oh, um, so there's a lot, there's a lot that went into it. Like the fact that the, uh, there's a lot of, lots of solos, like in the third movement, the, I start a lot of the themes and in the second movement, there's a lot of solos that I have. Also in the first, like just throughout the whole thing, there's a bunch of solos which you don't usually get as a violist in a string quartet, especially Beethoven. Like it, it was just, um, and also the fact that um, the viola is also like the middle voice. And so it's my job to bring everybody together and to blend the sound and to make sure that I'm in tune with everybody else. It's just, that was nerve wracking. And the fact that I was just so young compared to everybody else and I had never played anything like this before, that was very nerve wracking, but it was very fun. But I have to say, I mean, you you really brought uh, like a wonderful spirit to the group, and you know, I think I think mixing uh, different years uh, and different experience levels uh, works very well in many cases. I appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No, I know. I'm I'm keeping an eye on our feed just to see if there's anything. Again, lots of people coming back. Uh, I recognize some names from last time doing watch parties, which is fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Um, and, you know, it, it creates a different kind of intimacy associated with the genre, which was often in somebody's home. And so in a way, this is the uh, super postmodern version of that. We're all <laughs> a little bit siloed. Uh, but at the same time, there's something very, very intimate about doing watch parties and connecting uh, with each other in this way. Um, uh, Hannah follows up with this. I love this. So was Beethoven torturing the original violist? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Beethoven was torturing all his players. I was gonna say, all the this, time. Yeah. So now we can pump this out because we've talked about the difficulty um, of this quartet. It's super motivically saturated. And what we mean is that every little idea that he introduces, he's going to make sure that all four players interact with that idea. He's going to break it up and concentrate it. And it's often a quick volley that, you know, when he breaks and ups and fragments his motivic material, he doesn't just 
go at a slow, it's often really fast. And you've talked about some of that with the uh, coordination. And um, yeah. so, and, but I also want to say there's a, a Russian theme here. We'll get to that, but maybe you could talk about that quick volley difficulty and kind of motivic uh, basis that will come back in the late quartets, but he really kind of introduces it here with Opus 59. Yeah, well, I think Beethoven's way of, you know, taking like these little kernels and just, you know, sp sprinkling them around and changing them and uh, using them in all sorts of inventive ways. I mean, it, I, it comes from Haydn, but yet he takes it in kind of a new direction, I guess you could say. Um, I, I find 59 number two just, you know, just an amazing piece. I, I, I feel like right from the very beginning, the, the depth of character is so apparent, this kind of E minor ghostly beginning. Um, and, um, I, I, I think it's one of those things a little bit like, like Haydn, where you're sort of thrown off immediately for what you might be expecting. Like he starts with these great big chords, um, and then suddenly you get this, you know, you know, and everything stops. It's like, what's next? And then you get, you know, the same figure a little bit higher. It takes a while for the piece to get rolling. And I feel like that kind of mystery, uh, I, I think stays, stays through the whole piece. Um, we talked, uh, when we were talking, the three of us separately, we were saying that 59 number two somehow doesn't have the same renown or it doesn't get played maybe as much as the other two Razumovsky quartets. Um, and I think it's a shame because it has so much to offer. Um, the slow movement, of course, is beautiful. Um, and, uh, and Abby, I don't know, do you want to, uh, Abby gets to play this, uh, the Russian tune in the, in the third movement. Uh, why don't I uh, introduce why we even have some of those Russian tunes in this. Yeah. Uh, so the person who commissioned this was uh, the Russian ambassador to Vienna, and he has a wonderful account, Andreas Kirillovich Razumovsky. So Razumovsky uh, was a huge music fan. And in fact, he would often play second violin with Chupansi. So we have this relationship. He was crazy about music um, and he could afford to commission these works. So they've kind of kept his name. And uh, Russia had just had a battle against France in 1805, so the year before in the fall. Uh, and a lot of, I found out a lot of Russian um, wounded soldiers and people who couldn't get back home yet were in Vienna. So the sense of an allied relationship was also there. And he threw in uh, specifically tunes we know he borrowed for 59.1 and 59.2. 59.2 is my favorite, which is the hymn to the sun, the glorious hymn to the sun kind of, which we hear in Boris Gudinov, the opera of Mussorgsky. Um, and also Arensky and Rachmaninoff used it in pieces. So. Why don't you give us this uh, great tune and some people may re recognize it. All right, this is found in the third movement, a little bit after the beginning. <laughs> and, like, I, I start, the viola starts, and then you get, it gets passed around to all of the instruments in the quartet. It's really fun to play with everybody. In fact, he breaks it up, and some people have complained about that, that it doesn't get treated like <laughs> a theme of the usual, like, folk tune, recognize it. It's almost as though he's improvising in his head, as he would have done for many works that he does for piano, where he takes a theme and then does improvised variations. Um, there's one point, I think, where he almost seems to be in the, what we'd call the main key and the secondary key, the tonic and the dominant at the same time. Like he's got so much counterpoint going on that he's playing a lot with that in the trio section of the scherzo movement, the third movement, which is, you'll be able to listen for that. Um, just a, one last thing I'm checking to see. Ah, we have a question here. How was this received originally by the public critics and musicians? Well, in fact, as, as Scott already hinted at, they generally, the, the musicians thought it was really hard. And Chupansik was kind of saying, we can do this, but you're gonna cut out what has been the traditional amateur audience and, and players for this genre, the string quartet. So he felt it was a little bit dangerous that he wasn't in fact professionalizing 
the string quartet as a genre. So it was going to move past even those well-trained amateurs and was going to require the kind of quartet we see today, kind of dedicated to the genre and working with each other. Um, the critics in general, did the E minor was the, the top one. Uh, they, this quartet will hear today. I personally, I think it's, it's because it is kind of far reaching. It, it hints to things we'll see happen with the late quartets. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the words were bizarre. <laughs> that was a big one. It's bizarre. It's uh, complex. It's incomprehensible, which from our view seems very harsh and kind of unreasonable. Like it's, we can hear it. But I like one uh, person who was writing about the late style in general. They were talking about Leonora, actually, Fidelio, what would come up. Okay. And they said, you know, the thing about Beethoven is you need to listen to it more than once. He's asking for a more serious engagement than a lot of the music of the time was asking for. So I think that you could easily transfer to um, Opus 59 and to number two in particular. I'm seeing if we have any others. We're about where we should probably um, head off. I do want to say about the E minor, I read this and I thought it was interesting. We've had three quartets, F major, E minor, and C. Those three um, harmonies, those keys will be important within the quartets themselves, especially E minor has right from the beginning, which Scott was telling about, we have an E minor opening, jacks it up a half step to F major, which seems weird. So already here in these quartets, we're having the cyclic kind of ideas, these relations between works that we see later with the late quartets, right? Those bonds between them. I had not realized that. But he's, he chooses, it's weird because he does not write that many pieces in E minor. There's just a couple other in this key. So I think he did it because he was thinking already long-term relationships. He wanted to reflect those relationships. So it's unusual, but it's absolutely patent Beethoven, right? Thinking about these global relationships that are sometimes lost unless you spend a lot of time with these quartets. So uh, I think we'll probably can uh, start transitioning to our program. And we want to thank our viewers and listeners uh, who are posting questions and comments as we did last week. We will continue to engage with your posts and we'll add some commentary in the comment section throughout the performance. So if you have additional questions, please post them. And uh, of course, we encourage you to join us again next Thursday at noon for another lunchtime serving of Beethoven. Uh, next week will be the fantastic Opus 130 Quartet, uh, one of the famous late quartets, and that'll be played by the Kalidor Quartet. So let's get ready for Beethoven's Opus 59 number two quartet. It's funny, you know, even though I'm not actually playing it, I actually feel slightly nervous to be like re-watching it in this live format. Uh, so this is with myself on violin, uh, joined by three terrific Colburn students, Hannah Zahn on violin, Abby Smith on viola, and Minji Kim on cello. And this is from Zipper Hall at the Colburn School in downtown Los Angeles.
good quartet. It's such a good quartet. <laughs> we want to thank everybody out there uh, for joining our new weekly lesson series, Serving Beethoven. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's absolutely rocking performance of Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 59, number two, with our outstanding Colburn students together with Scott St. John. That's great. Thanks, Christy. And thanks, Abby, for being with us today. Please join us next week, Thursday at noon, for a fairly hefty serving of Beethoven, <laughs> the String Quartet, Opus 130, with the Kalidor Quartet. From everyone at the Colbert School, take care of yourselves, keep the music going in your lives, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>